I've read a few things in a few of the books where I'm like, um, where is that evidence in our life? <laughs> right. Uh, like the one where it was like a person who's successful always makes their bed in the morning. And I'm like, you never make our bed, ever. <laughs> Mainly because I'm still in it when he is up. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Separate Bathrooms. We would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay our respects to the elders both past and present. I am Ali Dado. I'm her husband, Cam. This is Separate Bathrooms. And it's an exciting moment because waiting outside patiently is a Hall of Famer and his equally impressive wife. Mm -hmm. Mm. Anyone who has been welcomed into a hall of fame has put in some hard yards. They've achieved at an elite level. Yes. Are you saying that they're a goat? They are a goat. They are a goat. The greatest (laughs) of all time of what they do. Right, right. Sporting codes have them. Music, acting, hall of fames. Here in Australia, we also have the Prospectors and Mining Hall of Fame. Let's not forget the Stockman Hall of Fame. Uh, correct. Did you know there was a Stockman Hall no, of Fame? No, I did not. I did not. <laughs> so awesome. Well, we're actually welcoming a man inducted into the Professional Speakers Hall of Fame. Yeah. And for that, you're going to have to have confidence, of course, and you have to know your stuff and be able to weave and tell a good story. Michael McQueen is a trends forecaster, a change strategist, and yes, an award-winning conference speaker. Yep. He features regularly on TV and radio as a commentator and is a best-selling author of 10 books. And his most recent book, Mind Stuck, Mastering the Art of Changing Minds, explores the psychology of stubbornness. <laughs> That's not you. No, it's not you either. There you go. Aren't we lucky? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and the art of 21st century influence. Yes, he's been formally named Australia's Keynote Speaker of the Year. Michael has been inducted, as we've been speaking about, into the Professional Speakers Hall of Fame. And Haley has his wife, his gorgeous wife, has worked in a number of roles from acting across the stage and screen to working as a producer and director for independent shows across Sydney. She's also co-founder and artistic director of Clock and Spiel Productions. Mm -hmm. She also lectures in the drama department of Excelsior College, for the past 15 years, saying it's a privilege to work alongside the students, advocating for them as unique artists and encouraging them in their creative Mm. endeavours. They are parents to one gorgeous boy. Indeed. And his name is? Maxwell. Hello, Max. Max, for short. There's certainly a lot that we can learn from Hayley and Michael McQueen, so let's get them in the bathroom. Hayley and Michael, welcome to the bathroom. Oh, thank you so much. Great to be here. Thank you. It's (laughs) great to be in here. (laughs) Nice to have you here in person as well. We love it when we have them in the actual bathroom. Yes. Now, we are a relationship, I was going to say, as you said the other day, a love podcast, which I really liked that. I did a love podcast. I did. It was great. It was was like, oh, yeah, it is. (laughs) It's a love podcast. How did you two meet? Do you want me to lead? Yeah, I can, you go. well, I'll take the lead. So, we met through friends, like the classic, like my best mate and Haley's best friend were friends and dating, ended up getting married. But right back in the start, we met through friends. So, I moved to Sydney from Wollongong. And mm. when I came here, I knew no one much in Sydney except yep. my best mate and his group of friends. Part of that group was Haley, So we met just as a group hanging out and it took a while. I think you were dating someone else at the time. Yes, the first time I met Michael, I was going out on a date with someone else. So yeah. like he oh. came to our apartment and to visit his friend and, um, you know, I met him on my way out basically. And, temporary um, boyfriend. Temporary boyfriend. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> he who so, shall yeah. not be named ever again. <laughs> the future ex. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And what was it about each other that you fell in love with? When when was that moment that you realised this yeah. is someone special? It definitely was a slow burn for me. And mm. I think for both of us, we yeah. had a really strong friendship for a number of years, really. So that was really special and we had always kind of had this beautiful rapport so yeah. you know an affinity we we made each other laugh a lot and it was just this kind of lovely yeah ease with each other mm. um but i didn't really see him as like <laughs> someone that i would normally I was in the wrong category in your mind for. um <laughs> And yeah, so I didn't really consider that. And there was lots of back and forth between mutual friends between, you know, do you think she, she would be interested? And, and I 
pretty much said no several times. Did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really did. And it was, you know, quite old school and quite, you know, high school really with like going through our friends and being them as having them Back as the med- yeah, yeah. the mediators yeah. and going, oh, look, I don't think she's interested, mate. And so, yeah, but to Michael's credit, he kept pursuing. And I think one night where we went out together, um, just into the city to watch some fireworks. And I think there was something about that. Oh, do you know what it was? I mean, it was a culmination of lots of things. Mm. But he left a note on my car. So we'd, I'd driven to his house. We'd caught a ferry into the city. And um, he left a note on my car at some stage. So when I got back to my car, it was like this beautiful handwritten note that said, I had a really nice time tonight. And, um, yeah, so something about that, yes. just something about that little gesture that was so thoughtful and so planned, I guess, and Hang on. something really... Well, did you write the note before yeah. you were the <laughs> yeah. So I think what happened was... Like, he must have yeah. gone home early and I, I went to visit raced someone out. else. That's sorry. right. So yeah. you, you had to go see another friend and then come back to your car. So I'm like, this is my moment. So I raced oh. inside, got a slip of paper. But it was a risk because I was on this one-way street in Chiswick, a tiny little suburb here in Sydney near Abbotsford, yep. tiny little peninsula suburb. And um, it has this one-way street and all the cars parked along there are pretty tightly packed. You had a Daewoo Lanos. Oh, yeah. That shows Come how on. old you were. Come on. Uh, Daewoo doesn't the even exist the anymore. Yeah. And there were two silver Daewoo Lanoses parked oh. one right near each other. I'm like, I best not put the note on the wrong car. Yeah. But I thought I knew, like, mostly your number plate, so I figured it out. Got it right, evidently. But, like, yeah, that was, yeah, leaving the note, that was, there was something about that. It was, it was something, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I mean, it was, it was definitely heading to in yeah. that direction, yeah. of course, but... Um, there was something about that moment. I thought, oh, this guy's actually a really, really beautiful guy. And mm. why why aren't I even allowing myself to kind of be open to this possibility just yeah. because of some preconceived ideas, I guess, of hmm. what I uh, what I thought I wanted. Yeah. So, yeah. And that takes some confidence to keep pursuing <laughs> like that. Yeah, it does. I yeah. guess I'm either naive or optimistic or yeah. whatever label you want to put on it. But I, I just, I could see there was something there that was more than just friendship, but wasn't sure it was a, a, a real thing, whether it could be a thing or not, but it was worth a shot. I figured, yeah. you know, like when you see something of value and you think, I'm just going to pursue this until the absolute answer is no. Mm. Um, I mean, I must say, I, I feel for... Like we'll, we'll all sound old. Remember the youngins in the like whole dating app land these days. Like mm-hmm. if you are in late teens, early twenties now, like yeah. that whole minefield. Like for us, it was still complicated and a risk, but in some ways, so so much simpler. So much simpler, <laughs> so much simpler yeah. than than it is now. So yeah. that was sort of the the world that we were in. So yeah, yeah persisted. So glad I did. Um, I'm so glad you did too. Oh, yeah, it's nice. Yeah, <laughs> and and so, and so w- when it's time to meet mum, that's usually a, a, a mm. big a big moment. You yep. you have quite a lovely story around that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So lovely is a like it's a word um, to describe it. Was it was a full on story? Hey, yeah. so the the backstory was and I only sort of thought of some of these details a few months ago for the first time. Haley, mum and dad had heard about this girl called Haley. They said, oh, we should meet her at some point. We weren't dating yet. And so I'd arranged, it was a, a Monday night in early October. And so um, they, oh, she was going to come down for dinner with the parents. And you must have been nervous. Were you nervous to come down? Had you really thought about no, it? No, no. Okay. No, it felt organic. There yeah. you go. So like this is in Wollongong. So it was an hour and a half drive to get to dinner. I was down south already for work. So you were going to drive down and we'll meet at mum and dad's place. Anyway, in the morning on the Monday, I rang dad just to confirm what can I bring, all the rest of it, mm. not realising like that would be the last time we'd speak. Mm. So it was, um, it would have been about nine o'clock I spoke to him in the morning to confirm details for the night. About 10.30, um, mum and one of my brothers found him collapsed um, pretty much gone. Like he'd had a heart attack. They called yeah. the ambulance. By the time the ambulance got there, there was nothing they could do. And he was young, right? Like, yeah, 51. Yeah, crazy. Gosh. Yeah, so it was just out of the blue, one of those crazy things. So obviously dinner was cancelled. Like even for us, like it got a bit funny for a few weeks there where I was like in grief mode trying to sure. support mum and all of that. So what it meant is that you came to the funeral on the Friday. So mm. Haley, like we weren't dating any of the rest of it. So you met my mum, all my family, at the, at the funeral and at the wake. And so and that was probably the special thing. Like, I'm like, if you stuck around through that, because yeah, it was just sure. so full on. So my dad was a school teacher and really dearly loved. So his funeral was this monster of an affair, like mm. eight or 900 people, 
like packed auditorium at a church. And they, like this was a big environment for you to step into as the, the random. And you had to get off work and sort of tell your yeah, boss, I'm going to go to a funeral, strangely, for a friend. Yeah, I had to kind of, because we weren't anything official, it was a mm. weird request for me and it was a big deal. I was teaching and so, you know, I said to my boss at the time, look, I don't know why, but I think this is really important. Mm. And so... Yeah, thankfully they were really understanding and, and I did go down. And, but the whole time I was thinking, I, I don't know if I, is this okay that I'm here? And yeah, um, hmm. yeah but I, look, I'm so glad I did too, because yeah. that's where I did in some way meet your dad and, mm. you know, get to know him. And that's, you know, the most I've kind of learnt about him was from that funeral. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Um, and, I, and I say, when I said a lovely story, yeah. and I mean that, I, I actually meant it in a way that it was based in love, yeah, yeah. Yep. you know, based on what you've you just said. Yeah. Then you kind of validated it, but just it was a that was that's a watershed moment it was. in your yeah. life, yeah. Yeah, definitely. and for you to be present yeah. in that moment yeah. as well, uh, and to have that as a memory in, in and a your memory relationship. for your mom as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, the ripple effect around that. Was, yeah, yeah. And I sometimes yeah. thought. I mean, at the time, I was like, I can't believe you were like five hours off meeting my dad, yeah. but it would have been worse if you'd been. A month off because yes. then you would have missed Everything. all those moments. Like you would, have, at least you were sort of part of the yeah. occasion. And so it was pretty full on. Like yeah. in that first few weeks and months, even we started then dating was a bit just dicey because, you know, I was traveling back to Wollongong a fair bit from Sydney every weekend to try and just be there for mum and all the, just the stuff, like the settling of estates and mm. all the practical things. It's such a massive deal when it's particularly when it's a shock. And so yeah. how do you like close bank accounts yeah. and like all that messy stuff? So yeah, so we sort of were on and off again for a few months and then sort of found our groove. How's your mum now? She's amazing. She? So we're coming up to 20 years this year. Yeah. Wow. And she, yeah, she's just been, I mean, she's always been very strong, very stoic, very able to just press on and be pragmatic. I'm one of five boys. You need to be say how many. a pragmatic wow. woman. Oh, correct. Yeah. She can handle <laughs> she's it. She's amazing. <laughs> but, you know, she, um, they, like, you just got on with life, did a lot of the dreams they had, but just on her own. So yeah. she's traveled and she's been yeah. audacious and built a life for herself. She's a remarkable person. Has she found love again? She hasn't. Yeah. I remember asking early on, do you think you ever will? And she was sort of nonplussed, like, I don't think so. Mm. Um, and I certainly don't think she was ever going to chase it. My yeah. goodness. Yeah. Imagine that on the dating apps. But as an older person, <laughs> what a nightmare. Um, so, yeah, I just think, <laughs> imagine that whole process. Yeah. So, but no, not nothing but, you know, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. But, yeah, she's an extraordinary person. Oh, that's beautiful. Can we just, before you came in, we did our introduction and, and I was talking about how how excited I was to meet a Hall of Famer. <laughs> because Hall of Famers are special people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and here you are, you are in the Professional Speakers Hall of Fame. Who knew there was one? Most yeah. people would never clue. I didn't yeah. until yesterday. Oh, I, I, was also, like, I said to Kim, like, go. there's a Hall of Fame for <laughs> yeah, I also, speakers. I also didn't know there's, there's a Stockman's Hall of Fame there as well. There you go. Well, that's oh, the yeah. next goal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a Prospectors and Miners <laughs> Hall of Fame in Australia. My goodness. goodness. Didn't know that. There you are. Um, it's a, I, I, I've emceed a bunch of events mm. where where we we you know, we have the professional speakers come in, the keynote speakers. Mm. We're all familiar with TEDx talkers yes, and yep. how impressive people are getting up and, and, and speaking what they know about. Yeah. How did you find yourself in the world of professional speaking? Well, 20 years I've been doing it. Yeah. So actually, I mean, interestingly, and it sort of all interweaves with the previous story. So I'd initially, I, um, as a as a kid, randomly, I always thought I loved listening to great communicators. Um, I always thought I'd like to be one. I remember as an eight year old, taking along to a conference for my parents' work because the babysitter had fallen through, and listening to a speaker who was just superb. And as an mm. eight year old, now little boy's eight, so I look at him and think, "Gosh, I can't believe I was that young." Yeah. Watching mm. this woman speak and just being transfixed, and mm. saying to my parents afterwards, "That's what I want to do." And they politely went, "Oh, that's a nice idea," <laughs> as you do with your eight year old when they say what they want to be. Do you remember what she? was talking about she spoke about yes um like temperament personality styles and and so and she was just hilarious she talked about you know her and her husband were such different personalities and so she, a lot of that was sort of that bounce okay. off so she was just very practical very relational but yeah really great communicator so she held an entire room 
for a whole hour, I think yeah. it was. So, yeah, wow. so that from age eight, I was sort of like, how do you do that? I met a few people while I was at uni who were doing it full time on the conference circuit. So I got a bit of mentoring and they said, you've got to find something you can be the expert in. And I was 22. So you can't be much of an expert at anything really when you're 22, except being young. Yeah. And so I thought, well, maybe being young is an asset if I maybe specialise in the whole generation gap theme. So there was a lot of people talking about Gen Y versus Gen X and baby boomers. Not very many young people speaking about that as a topic. So I'm like, Mm. maybe that could be the thing I focus on. So I did this body of work basically around generational differences, showed it to my dad, who was a careers advisor at a school. And he said, you know, this is really interesting, this manuscript for this book because we're getting funded to do stuff in schools to help kids prepare for the world after school, you could put together like a program of stuff and speak in schools. That'd be a good way to cut your teeth and get started. So all he'd done is he sent an email to this woman who headed up the Careers Advisors Association um, in New South Wales and saying, this is my son. He's written this this book or this manuscript about generational change. Might be cool to do some stuff in schools. Could you maybe just have a chat with him? So he'd sent that. And think about timing here. He sent that on the Wednesday or the Thursday before he passed away. Ooh. I know, like, this is like a pretty full on time. When I think back, so many little things like line up and clicked in at this point. So post-funeral, I remember looking at that email, sitting in my inbox because he's, he'd CC'd me and thinking, like, he'd, he at least he made the intro. I should follow this up just to honour him, I guess. Had that meeting, a woman named Lynn Camp, bless her. She was so encouraging. I like, mm-hmm. couldn't be more helpful. Helped me sort of figure out how to put together some programs, market that to schools, and that's how I started. So I spent three or four years working in schools, around Australia and then beyond, particularly helping young kids understand the real world. Like, what's what's your boss going to be like? How do you play the game, get on at work, flourish in the workplace when you leave school? All the stuff they don't teach you at school, the practical sort of life and work skill stuff. And then the scope broadened to look at not just generational change, but then societal trends, technology trends. And then the most recent research has been around why people don't change even when the world's changing around yeah. them. So. That's 10 books over 20 years. Sort of that's been the general trajectory over that time. So it started off, yeah, fairly simply. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and you sort of, you've spent the last 20 years doing so much research as well, yeah, haven't you? It. Because based on the books that you've written as mm. well, there's so much research based in yeah. that. But is that something that you've always loved as a kid as well? Like diving oh, into no, that No, not at all. No. I can't stand it. Oh. So no, I, well, I do it because I need to. Okay, I sort of yeah. feel like, particularly like the most recent book is a deep dive into neuroscience and behavioral psychology. And I'm neither a neuroscientist or a behavioral psychologist. So I, and I never want to present to be something I'm not. Mm. So yeah. it's like I need to really get my head around what's what's being said that's you know verified and valid and helpful, and then what can I add that's new. So that just okay. means reading widely. Yeah. Like I'll never wander into a new area, I guess, with that arrogant assumption that I've read. I read two books. I'm set. You know, like now I'm going to speak into this myself. So, like this last book was almost nine years from go to woe in terms of the research and stuff. Um, that's long. Most books I'll churn out in about eighteen months. Yeah. But mm. even still, I'll read really widely. Um, and then interview experts in the field as part of that process. Mm. So I, I don't want to feel like a fraud. I think that's the yeah. biggest thing. And because. Your last book, you mm. talk about Mindstruck. Mindstuck, yeah. Oh, Mindstuck, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's the next book is Mindstruck. <laughs> yes. There you go. I'm Prophetically. I'm I kidding. like it though. I'm like, <laughs> that's, gee, that's good. There, there you go. go. That's Struck. It. Yep. It's about creativity. There you go. I Struck that. gold. I'll just take 10% of the profits <laughs> on that one. <laughs> And Haley, for you, your love of the arts and yeah. entertainment, where did that come from? Is that from an early age as well? or? Yeah, I think so. I had a, um, an aunt who was a theatre director and, you know, costume designer, set designer. And I always had an affinity with her and was always fascinated by what she did. And, and so I think it was very much one of those early interests and passions and I've never really wanted to do anything else other than Mm. make theatre which at many times throughout my adult life I wished that I had (laughs) perhaps had other interests like perhaps I don't know being an accountant or you know something that paid money and that you know do the accountancy for the theatres that you're working not with. if you can't do maths <laughs> oh, okay fair enough I'm with you on um, that yep not good at maths <laughs> no I, I just can't escape it really yeah. even if I'd kind of try hmm. um now I I have my own theatre company um, with a business partner and we do a couple of shows a year and that's really great and lots of work and all of that stuff. And then I also teach a university level course 
for actors and theatre makers and things like that. I've always kind of found my my home in, yeah. in that, in storytelling, mm. in visual arts and, yeah. Well, that's, I was going to say, I, how many times have we had this conversation, Can where there's been a desert of jobs and <laughs> I've gone, well, what else are you interested in? What else do you want to do? <laughs> I don't have anything else. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have anything else. This is all I've ever wanted to do. This is all I can yes. do. I don't have, what do you want me to do? Just become a pizza delivery man? You used to throw that one out all the time. Yeah. I'm like, it was either an actor or a pizza delivery you know, man. Like, that were the only two options. Yeah. Wow. And I actually, I was like, there, Surely there was something. There was a moment where we were so on the skids in, in LA at one point that I actually went to the local pizza shop. Uh, Remember that? Yeah, and I asked them for a job. And they said, the lady goes, I said, look, I'll deliver, um, I'll work, I'll tidy, I'll clean in the back, I'll do the kitchen. And she said, you need to work out the front as well. And I said, I can't do that. Wow. And she said, you have to. Everyone has to work out the front one day or one shift a week or something. And I said, nah. Why, well, I was, why was that? Why didn't I want to do yeah. it? At, at the front. Well, it meant it meant looking after customers, and right. we lived in an area where 20th Century Fox was, yeah, and a lot of the it. studio execs and stuff were there. And yeah. I, just, I, I just could not work myself up to being seen as yeah, well. yeah. waiting on someone at that point. Yeah. I mean, because we had three kids, yeah. we yeah. had a house, we were. Yeah. It was big stakes, yeah, yeah for yeah. me. And I, I ended up not. I ended up doing another job, but I didn't do that one. <laughs> so. It's so tough on your identity, isn't it? When it, you when you have something that you man. just you feel that you have the skills in and that you have the, you know, the passion for and that you just then can't do <laughs> because yes. of a whole, it, whole bunch yeah. of things. Because it's, it's based on so many other yeah. decisions it's, that exactly, are out of your hands. Exactly. Yeah. And there was shame attached yeah. to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And which was, that was the hardest part. Yeah. And I thought, oh, because I'd said to Al, I, I'm, I'm just going to get a job. I'm, we need yeah. cash. Yeah. We need money. And I'll just go get a job. And then when, when that part of it, the shame part of it going, I can't let, anyone see me mm. doing this. Yep. Ooh, it was a brutal, brutal yeah, that's time. that's really hard. Mm. Do you, Haley, help Michael with his presentations? Do you ever? Because you, you can bring your skills. Yeah, yeah that's I mean, right. clearly he's a Hall of Famer and he probably doesn't need it. But, <laughs> that's right. yeah. but maybe that's why he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, Haley. Over to you, Haley. Over to you, Haley. Haley. Over to you, Haley. Man. That's right. Look, I think perhaps in the early days, mm. I mean, it's always that thing though, right? The people who you're closest to often can't give yes. the, the advice because you're too close and it's too much, you know. But really he is doing exactly what he is created to do and so he's very, very good at it naturally. He's had to obviously work really, mm. really hard but there is some really natural skill there and it's like your career is not built on my input, and that's yet, for sure. <laughs> and yet wardrobe input was very helpful. Oh, my goodness, oh, yes. My Holy goodness. moly. Post, post yeah. honeymoon, I remember coming back and one day you're going through my wardrobe. <laughs> I was left with like two shirts and a pair of jeans. It was like, terrible. It was just, I look back and I'm like, oh, it was a shocker. Like, I just, it was so I bad. I don't know. I grew up in, well, you look, you oh, right, I'm I'm looking, now. I love that. You look really put it's together and I'm like, what's the, he's got the beautiful black pair sneakers on it. Yeah, you're looking very sweet. I, did. I bought Actually, that shirt. Like, yeah. At the time, I wasn't offended. I was just more fascinated. I'm like, wow, I was so evidently hideous and unaware. <laughs> yeah, so you are very helpful because I'm quite, I'm, I'm very boring. I'm very oh, structured, pragmatic, like predictable, linear. That's my temperament style. So I'll find a thing. Like if I, if I find a shirt that fits, I will buy every colour or like right. multiples of the one colour because they get faded and like they may not be back in store in a few months' time and... Wow. I'm so boring. I've always dreamed of there doing that. Go. Like, yep. I get that great pair of sneakers, right? Oh, yeah. It feels so good. Get four pairs. I should have bought two. Yep. No, yeah. you're saying four pairs. Oh, yeah, go all out. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got to be classic. So, like, it does. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So, yes. passes but through also, time. Yes. Correct. Yeah. But I have to say, we've, uh, we've, fi <laughs> we've finally managed to get me and the kids, Cameron, out of purple cargo shorts. Ooh. Oh. Camouflage. Oh, camo. Camouflage. Camo purple, purple cargo, cargo shorts. shorts. Okay, Ooh. all right. He really? came yeah, out in those and we're everyone, the whole whole family was like, oh, oh golly. Yeah, kids were like, dad, no. And mind you, you were, you were wearing it with a flannel shirt wow. that yeah, was yeah. blue and yellow. And was you it, went yeah, out to and... dinner like that. And, and the kids came up to me and said, is dad okay? Like, is there something going on? And I'm Trying like, to no. Him. He just did not care what he was wearing. <laughs> Clearly. Wardrobe intervention for like, dad. And you're like, goes. I'm like, honey, yeah. nope, no. not yeah. on any planet. No. 
Let's talk about this now that we're, we're, we're not having an argument and there's no winning. Your Instagram, you talk about never winning an argument because you lose a relationship. Mm. Can, you, can you explain that? Because it could have been that way over the cargo shorts. <laughs> it could well it have could been. Have. That's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and so I guess that's part of my, my vibe generally. Um, and it's something I've had to learn, to not be competitive, to want to win. Because that, that was a family I grew up in. We'd sit around and have arguments and debates and try oh, and one-up each other. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a lot um, of well, four boys energy in there. Yeah. And, and both parents with scientific mindsets. So, like, you know, wanting to t- talk, not like overly serious, but just still talk about real stuff at the table and all the rest. So... That was a vibe I grew up in. And so to win an argument, to one up at one of your brothers, to trounce them with logic was sort of like, that was the goal. And I think that's <clears> valuable <throat> in one sense, but you just see how that's playing out around the globe right now of yeah. everyone just lobbing ideological grenades at each other and mm. it's not working. And mm. I think that's because that's where I came from background wise and also temperament wise. I guess I'm mm. naturally someone who likes to win, win the argument, have the are best you, logic. Are you the oldest? I'm second oldest. Yeah. So my oldest right. brother is, oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. It's the second oldest, but my older brother is like proper, highly intelligent, will win any argument just because oh, yeah. he's smart and yeah. he's very good with logic. And but just noticing what that means in terms of the way, not just for him, but just generally when you have that posture toward the world, people might agree with you, but they often just, they want to stop discussing because they, they yeah. feel overwhelmed or yeah. they feel bullied, intellectually bullied. So I guess the focus for me, particularly with this new book and body of research, is how, how do we come together and learn again? Like changing other people's minds, having influence that's going to be constructive requires people being willing to listen, to learn, to actually be willing to meet in the middle. And if you look historically over the centuries, we've done that really well. That's what debate always was. Mm. And yet something about the last couple of centuries has become very much, I mean, post-enlightenment era is very much bring your best logic to the table, trounce the other person with reason, rational thought. The, tra- the reality is, and we've discovered this in the last five to ten years, is that that just doesn't work. And the more rational evidence you bring to any conversation, the harder you push, the more people dig their heels in. Even if deep down they know what you're saying is true, if they don't have agency in the process and feel they can actually change their mind because they decided to, mm. then they'll actually cross their arms and not change their mind at all. So that's, yeah, that's been a real learning for me. So mm. how do you have a very humble posture toward other people, other ideas? Because that's how you have constructive conversations. Mm. And how has that worked as a couple? Have mm. you applied mm. that? <laughs> well, it, it's interesting. <laughs> not very well. Yes. <laughs> The reason, I, the reason I pause is because like, we're so different because you're quite, you're a peacemaker. Yes. So on the Enneagram scale, have you heard of the Enneagram yeah. scale? So you're like the quintessential peacemaker. And um, I, I don't know what the other one is. The one that I'm, I'm number three, I think, or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, achiever or yeah, challenger. Yeah, so the challenger. So I'm like always challenging, whereas you're like trying to keep peace. So the funny thing is I've got to be super mindful that Haley's silence or happy to just go with things doesn't mean that she agrees, but just means the conversation is just... It's not worth having. It's not worth having a debate or a, yeah. a point of conflict. Mm. So, like, for me, the big thing is listening. I had this great mm. thing I read recently from Oscar mm. Trimboli. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's got a great book on listening. And he said, never forget that I'm listening. The word listen and silent are made up of the same letters. And, like, mm. and like, I thought, that's, wow. I'd never thought of that. I'm nice. like, that is so fundamentally true and actually really profound. Like, yeah. I can fill the space with words. I'm the talker. Haley's the quiet one in the relationship. So, like, for me, a lot of that is about... Giving space, giving time to genuinely listen um, and not just listening with the intent to reply, but just listening to understand. So that's been, I think it's been a really helpful thing over the years. Unconsciously we've done it, but I think I've been more aware of consciously doing it after writing this book for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think absolutely. And it just, um, in this, you know, a a marriage and long-term relationship, it's really just deciding to get to know each other. And I know that sounds very... (laughs) like base level, but as in really knowing, okay, how do they best communicate? What does actually speak to them the most profoundly? Like in, in what way is, that, is your communication going to speak to them? Mm. And um, well, what form, what shape does it take? What words, what do they need to to feel like they're being listened to and mm. that their opinion is kind of um, heard and processed and, um, because it is so different. We're all, we're are all different and we're all different at all different times. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> right. So it's ever changing yep. as well. Yeah. Throw in some, um, you know, hormones in there and it's like, it's crazy. So I think it's just really deciding to, to learn the other person and being willing to 
to shift yourself and and um which is really hard I'm a really stubborn person <laughs> Michael is much more flexible I you think reckon? I would have said I'm more stubborn there you go mm, maybe it's like a willingness you're very yeah, right. very open and willing to change yeah, right. whereas me I, I get a little bit more stuck I think mm. but you can real just railroad with like logic and pragmatism and like <laughs> words big words yeah, yeah and yeah. then <laughs> and then <laughs> too many words too many words, too many words. Too many words. <laughs> so that is challenging yeah we've got really really differing kind of approaches to stuff but it's great because it, it is often means like, as in often Absolutely. i'll go to say something or have a view and Haley be like but what about and i think you know what that's mm. so true i hadn't thought of it from that perspective before mm. and so i've just learned over the years that you're a really good sounding board for my very firm views on stuff because I mean, I live in a world where you're rewarded for having firm views. Yeah. Like you've got to have a soundbite answer that tells people exactly what to do, what's going on and why it matters. Like in any number of things. Like I'll do a thing on TV and they only want a soundbite answer yeah, to yeah. sum right. up a complex idea. Yeah. Yes. And so that's what I'm rewarded for. That's what most people in the media are rewarded for is yeah. simplistic soundbite Mm. superficial answers that just are palatable. It's, yes. kind of, it's kind of analysis, isn't it? Yeah. It's a very short analysis of something that we can mm. walk away with. Yeah. yeah. And the so elevator a, pitch. Correct. Yeah. And we're sort yeah. of, we're instructed mm. to do that marketing wise, but we are pro- often approach so much of life like that. And mm. I can fall into that trap. And so you're a really good softener for that. And, you know, it's, I think like most relationships, we're so different. And as long as you see that as a plus, even though it's yes. highly annoying at times for all of us, like, cause that is challenging. Yeah. You have to, cooperate and yeah. make allowances for like I read this meme the other the um, other month I sent to Haley. I'm like this is us to a T this meme that I saw on Instagram in every relationship there's someone who stacks a dishwasher like a Swedish architect and someone who stacks it like a raccoon on meth and I'm like <laughs> yes that is like I am the like every knife is in order like in the fork because that is the most efficient way to get those things clean and you're like you're just piled on in there and so yeah. like you see those differences play out and it can be difficult but also rich and super helpful. <laughs> with with each book that you've written, mm. do you find Haley that like Michael changes the way he is with you in some way? Like because he's got all this research, he's yeah. got like I'm going to try this out, or this is the way I'm going to yeah. language and I'll talk to you about. Like, is that a good thing, or do you feel strategized sometimes? Uh, no. Well, interestingly, That's there was a good question. It's I an want excellent to know the question. <laughs> it's an excellent question. There was I've read a few things in a few of the books where I'm like, um. Where is that evidence in our life? Right. Uh, like the one where it was like, I don't know, was it called Momentum or something? And it was like, a person who's successful always makes their bed in the morning. And I'm like, you never make our bed, ever. <laughs> Mainly because I'm still in it when he is up. It's true. I'm the morning person. Yes. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, certainly there's like, a, <laughs> the you know, a subject matter enters our household and is talked about a yeah. lot. Mm. Um yeah, and there's always so such great. You always bring such great perspectives. Like you always have. Like, oh yeah, I read this and I yeah. read that, and I, so it is like it's pretty awesome um, being married to someone who is so curious mm. and who who can distill really complex philosophical things or scientific things into something that is really palatable and and simple. Yeah, and that that's. That takes a very, very clever person. Mm. And so it's like having a, you know, excellent resource for dummies in your household because you <laughs> <laughs> because he just stills everything down and I think, oh, okay, yeah, I understand that. Well, I was going to say, and the, the other value of the differences is like, you know, you talk about you're going for the job at the pizza place. Mm. Like, I think there's something about in any relationship or any human's life, if you have that moment, it, it just opens up a whole category of empathy you can't have any other way. Yep. And for us, that was when COVID hit. Mm. So like for us, COVID hit just as we'd finished a renovation that went way over budget. So we were like pretty much at square one again financially, like mm. almost going to lose everything. So I think it was very, very touch and go. But you know, this was sort of February 2020. We moved back in. The house wasn't quite finished. We had to borrow money from my mum just to get back in. It was all like, oh, we're really stretched. This has been a a real stress and not by plan or design, but renovations often do that. They just yep. go way over budget. Anyway, yeah. so we're like, that's okay. I'll just work my backside off for the next 12 months. We'll try and get back to square one. Right. Three weeks later, COVID hits. And essentially both our industries, like the mm-hmm. arts and lecturing and conferences are made illegal. You know, you just can't gather with people. Yep. And so we lost the whole deal. Like I had four months of revenue locked in that was going to get us back to square one. It all cancelled in 36 hours. The whole calendar <sighs> gone. 
And so we're sitting in this house that we can't afford to even be in. We had friends buying groceries for us. I remember, in fact, it was one of these interesting experiences where um, I'd come back from a thing for QuickBooks, the big accounting mob in London. So this huge conference, they flew me business class there and back. So lovely, wonderful. Get there's fruit baskets, there's driver limousine services, the whole deal. It's all lovely, but I'm... To me, it's all just a bit funny, really. But so um, I remember actually coming back from London with a suitcase half full of toilet paper because Haley's messaging saying there's no toilet paper in Coles and Woolies anywhere here. So I'm like, oh. it's still in London, so I'll bring it home. I'd pinch it all off the little the trolley where they you know, do the rooms, clean the rooms. This is so a I... police officer at the <laughs> customs <laughs> office. <laughs> They've been That's, searching you. Uh, oh, I had the contraband. They should show me a sign looking for that guy That's for it. all the TP <laughs> stuff. All the toilet paper. <laughs> it was coming back with that whole vibe going on. Yeah. And so within two weeks of like the whole... Fruit baskets and limos and all fanciness. We come back, we're like on skid row type mm. deal. And I remember having to, because the government said we've, we're going to do some support for small businesses, yeah. but you have to have your like the Centrelink ID to get on and see what you're qualified for. And I didn't have an ID number. I'd never had to engage with Centrelink much yeah. before. I'd been very fortunate with that. So I lined up at Chatswood Centrelink. One morning, got there at 5.30 because they had to get there early. The line was already like around the block. Mm. And it was like that moment of you like, how do I feel? What's the that sense of incongruity between who I am and who I want to be and yeah. what I'm doing right now. See, here I am at Chatswood Centrelink, having driven our stupidly expensive mm. Lexus that we were on, on a lease with. So I'm like, yeah. I can't get rid of the car. And I'm driving to Chatswood in this like ludicrous vehicle for where we're at right now. But that was that was a really interesting time. And the, the difference in us was really valuable because mm. I I was a quite embarrassed at how I responded. I didn't do great. Like mm. I found it very difficult mentally. I wouldn't say it was depressive, but it was the most, is the darkest I've ever been, definitely. Mm. And what I, I clicked into um, victim mode really fast and I didn't expect that. And yeah. again, someone who's written a lot about things like that, how do you choose a, a constructive response to circumstances in life? I found in that situation it was really difficult to apply some of that. You were heaps better. You were like very pragmatic, very calm. In that mu- few months where we tried to piece life back together and build a studio to do virtual sessions. Mm. My gosh, what a learning curve that was. Mm. Like all that stuff to trying to figure out how to make it all work. Yeah. That difference was so valuable because mm. you were very, very sensible and pragmatic when I was, yeah, sort of struggling a bit. Yeah. Isn't that interesting, the, uh, the idea you can have all the theory yeah. in your head about yeah. how to do something. It's not until you're actually in the trenches. Yeah. And, and you, you actually have to come up with it and you're yeah. faced with something like yeah. that that you didn't – you know, you're on your ass. Oh yeah, yeah. and then you never got... could have imagined what no. happened as well. Yeah, no well, one has no. ever imagined Correct. a pandemic. And, and that lovely yes. word, the incongruity of yeah. of you flying business class. You're up the front of the plane. You're eating yeah. all this sumptuous food, and you know that your mates are delivering some groceries to your house. Yeah. We've yeah. been there. Long. You've done it. Yeah. We've yeah. totally done it. As I looked at each other as you're saying it, uh-huh. I was just going, "Oh my god!" Yeah, but it it is. It's so. It's so humbling, but and and you have it grows an appreciation, yeah, yep. and a gratitude for when things start to roll again. Yeah, Correct. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. And I think yeah. that was the hard thing in that mm. moment was that I was up for resilience and hard stuff, and I'd done lots of hard things, but I'd always done hard things I'd chosen to do. Yeah. yeah. Suddenly, Christ. I had to apply the same principles when it wasn't fair. Yeah. Stuff I had no control over that had been done to us or around us. And I just, yeah, it was interesting. That was where I just. And so did you go with the not fair, the victim used that Mm, word before mm. as well. Was that a team effort? Were you guys really, did you band together? Was it a galvanizing of the relationship at that point? Oh, not at the start, I don't think. I think it was really tough. I think it was because our reactions were so different Mm. and I couldn't quite understand I mean, I could understand his perspective, of course, but I couldn't understand why he was choosing to be, even having all the knowledge of, you know, we're, we're safe and we have resources and, you know, all the, the logical things that you go through. I couldn't understand why then still the emotion of it and was so mm. reactive and all of that kind of stuff. And that's okay that I couldn't understand it and it didn't take away from the fact that that's valid what you were feeling. Mm. So it was tricky. Mm. It was really tricky to kind of come together in that moment because it was there was a real divide. But I think it was just a couple of key things for you that then clicked in. I think once the rest of the world caught up with the fact that we were in a pandemic and that everyone was losing their jobs and job keeper came in and things like that. Mm. Then I think you started to be able to kind of deal with it a little bit more yeah. less emotionally. I, wondered, I know for <laughs> us you know, your identity, certainly as the man, you were the, the breadwinner mm. and your identity was very much 
I'm an actor, mm. you know, and a bit maybe a bit similar for yeah. you as well, where my identity was being a mum, mm. and I still had the kids, you know, when mm. we went through bankruptcy. My role never changed, as yours didn't. You had Max. Right. right. So it's sort of like yours was ripped away yeah. because you were there. I'm the, I'm the speaker. I'm the, you know, the big money guy, yes. you know, bringing yeah. it in like you. And mm. I think that makes that the stakes so much higher yeah. in that way. But it, for us, it was it was a really helpful balance. If I lost it as well, we were really going down. So I think <laughs> yes. probably I know that yeah. feeling where yes. you go, I can't go down this path with him. I've right. got to stay right. upbeat. Mm. So one of us has to. <laughs> yes. yes. Or yep. else we're really, really, really down the shit up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah. The idea of, you know, when you're tense with that sort of stuff and that shock, you're in the sh- and, you, and you're tense and you know as an actor, and I'm sure you're telling your students at the college that, that tension is the enemy, yeah. you know, of performance. And you know <laughs> mm-hmm. that. You're mm-hmm. more relaxed. You're more available yeah. Yeah, to, to answers and stuff like that. Where does breathing fit in to mm-hmm. you guys in that way of becoming more accepting of what's happening? Yeah. Oh, great question. I mean, yeah, I think I've used breathing as a tool for so long in like, yeah, work and teaching and giving space and, but it's really easy to forget, isn't it? Just Mm. to like Mm. (laughs) give yourself some time and space. But Mm. I don't know for you, do you? Probably not breathing, but I do have like specific things I do to try and keep that equilibrium. Um, so actually one of our friends, little ones the other day asked this question, like kids are so perceptive, aren't they? Yeah. He said, so Michael, I'm just curious, why do you always walk really slowly? And I didn't know I walk slowly. Evidently, oh, apparently I do. Interesting. And when I stopped, stepped back and thought about it, it is something deliberate about being slow. I'm in a world where I'm on planes every second day. I'm on stages. Like it's, it's chaotic and unpredictable and all the rest. What can I control? I can control in that moment my own personal rhythm. So like mm. walking slowly allows me to sort of just stay grounded and, and chill. But I also do, I'm like, I journal every day. Like I, I have things that are rhythms that help keep balance. And that was yeah, probably the other thing right. about COVID is all those rhythms got yeah. shot. You yes. couldn't leave home. There wasn't that sense of like, yeah, the things that I do, I can go places to like get that sense of balance and that all stopped. So even finding those rhythms in that moment was really tricky. Yeah. But yeah that's, that's I find really important. Breathing. I, I'm, I don't think about it, but I, I bet it's a part of the equation. Mm. Well, you're slowing it down. Yeah. yeah. I find if I lose my lines uh, on stage, it's that moment, just stop, breathe yeah, and relax. And they usually come back yeah. nicely. Yeah. And then some, oh, that was a good moment. Cam was like, <laughs> oh, bloody forgot my line. <laughs> but not that's to panic. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's right. Right. You deep in thought. In that <laughs> that's right. right. That's, oh, so that's I was I'm internally <laughs> panicking. <laughs> You've been on stage or shared the stage with some incredible people. Mm. Is there one person that you met that still stays with you as an incredible speaker that you've taken inspiration from or anything like that? I reckon one of the people that I really enjoyed speaking on stage with most was Steve Wozniak. Oh, yeah. So Apple's co-founder. Yeah. I was just (laughs) struck by how um, accessible he was. Ah. Like just so kind. And gave time to people, and we spent a good good amount of time chatting backstage. And sometimes, you know, you'll you'll share the stage with people. You might meet them briefly, but they're being managed or whatever. And he was just so accessible. The other one was um John Maxwell, who's a leadership expert, written a pile of books on leadership. And we were backstage at this big shindig in the states, like twenty thousand people type thing in the bowels of this big um, auditorium thing, and so present. Mm. Took time, really keen, really curious. Yeah, that's, that's always a good sign, I think, when mm. people are really interested, genuinely interested. Yes. So I try to remember that just for me as well with others. Like just, yeah. Just, it it's speaks hard. It's so, a choice, isn't it? It does. It Such speaks so loudly when you value people. And that's yeah. what he did beautifully. Mm. Yeah. Has your son seen you do keynote speaking? Yeah, he came last year, I think, for the first time. At, was there was an event too? in Melbourne I was speaking at and he was just quite fascinated because we were backstage in the green room they had lollies and, and yeah, right. drink oh, and food. Yeah. But also at the end there was this standing ovation, um, which doesn't happen heaps, but when it does happen, it's fun in Australia. It's not part of our culture. And yeah. he was just yeah. like 
super excited oh. to see that. So I took him up on stage during the sound check so we could see what the room looked like and you could just like wide eyed. Yeah. So it was sort of funny because he's like, he has no idea. I just go to the airport all the time. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. But also yeah, yeah. not every event is like that. You need to know this. Like yeah. some of them are, are less glamorous. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, that was really special. They don't have M&Ms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah, not every right. event. <laughs> just jazz crackers and that's it. On that topic of your son and you you have written, you know, Mind Stuck, which mm. is about how to move out of stubbornness and, mm. you know, how to work with stubborn people. Mm. How does it work with the little ones? Does it work with the little ones? <laughs> is there any tips in that realm? Oh, it is tricky because, I mean, it's like any human, but you see it especially with young kids, if they feel they haven't got a choice, they do push back. Like, you know, when they're super tired, sitting at the dinner table, yep. eyes falling out, oh, you yeah. say, you look tired. I'm not tired. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> I'm not cold, blue mouth. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And so it's always a case of like with anything, but particularly young kids, giving them that sense of control. Like you've got two choices, make a choice, as opposed to this is what I want you to do. Even yep. simple things like that, the way you frame questions, ask for their input, like it just gives them that sense of control and agency that I think as humans we all want. Mm-hmm. We want to feel like we're in the driver's seat. The moment sure. we feel like that's being impinged on, that's when we resist. And you see that especially with kids. Yeah. I, I hate it on TV shows when they go, oh, we're out of time. It's like, we well, should have managed it better, you know. Um, <laughs> I'd love to I'd love to have you guys back because th- uh, this has been a great chat. Oh, it's been a joy. And well, I feel like we've only scratched the surface yeah, cool. of lovely. where we wanted well, to go lots today. Of, there was lots. lots of great stuff. Guys, we, we do a thing called the two-minute shower Ooh. here. And so we're saving water, so keep your Good. answers short. Just um, both answer the question, okay. please. Okay, here we go. First question. What habit does your partner have that you find adorable? Oh, adorable. Mm. <laughs> and they're easy we're, to do annoying, oh, yeah. but we go adorable. <laughs> adorable. Okay, adorable. I'm going to reframe the adorableness. He is like the washing, I don't know if I can call him the washing Nazi. Can I say that? <laughs> Yes. Um, uh, about the yeah, washing king. King, that's much better. <laughs> Thank king. you so much. Right. The washing yeah, king. Yeah, because I'm the washing king in our house. Right. right. He yeah, is yeah. like absolutely obsessed with um, like when would be the best time of this day to bring out, like to do the washing. And the washing is done every single day. Sometimes I'm wearing things that get ripped off my body because he thinks, <laughs> no, no, I'm doing it. I'm doing a load of darks. Will that be, I'm like, I'm wearing it now. <laughs> Give it to me now. Give it to me now. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, but okay. it's adorable because it's useful. I there you go. There you go. Um, Haley does voices and like gets full method acting with our little one. So you will race around the house <gasps> being characters, which is, I mean, I find it sometimes frustrating when it's like, it's time to go to school. We must get out of character <laughs> to put shoes on and get out the door. But like, it's very sweet. And like you two are very similar like that. You're peas in a pod. It's very Ooh. sweet. If you could relive one day with each other, what would it be? Ooh. Oh, oh, there's been so many good ones. So many good ones. Yeah. I think it would have to be one of our like travel adventures. Yeah, so same. like Positano or Ooh, wow. like yeah. Austria, like riding bikes through that beautiful woods in Canada. Yeah, or cool. um, We've been very, very lucky to do lots of beautiful, mm, beautiful yeah. And this is because the Hall adventures. of Famer speaker gets it, to go exactly. all around the world. Not because True. I make theatre. Let's just say that. <laughs> well, yes. And also, and this is probably, it'd be good to unpack, we had, we, if we had time, we travelled heaps because we it took forever to have kids. Like yeah. years of the whole RVF caper. So we we're like, let's oh. not wait and delay life until, like, yeah. you can so easily do that. We're like, let's just see, adve- like, have adventures while we wait. Yeah. So we did, we really prioritised that. So we did travel heaps before kids, which is great because after kids is highly annoying with, you know, travel. Anyway, so um, I would say Badgestein, tiny town up in the mountains in Austria. Wow. We went, this is yes. what I'd live again. We went on a, a, a horse drawn <laughs> sleigh <laughs> at night. <gasps> Through oh. the snow, I know it's wild, and like the 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 bells jingling. Yeah, and the we whole were drinking vibe. schnapps in the back. Oh. Yeah. That was pretty cool. The Fontrack family singers were walking past you singing. It was, yeah. singing. It was it really. Was, I would really like cool. to relive that with you guys. <laughs> it was oh, wild. It was awesome. Yeah. Very cool. All right, um, Haley, I would like you to answer this one in your f- in your favourite voice that you oh, do. No, no, don't no. put it no, on. No, no. Why do you? No, you're not a seal. I got, I'm not a performer. Okay, what is it about your relationship that makes you feel grateful? Oh my goodness. There's so many, obviously. I think having someone that you can trust absolutely that and knowing deep like in the deepest parts of you that they have your best interest at heart. Okay. Mm. That's love it. Yeah. Laughter, fun. Like you've got a great sense of humor. 
and yeah, we match well with that, which I just love. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful. Last question: one word to describe each other. Oh, look, there's probably much more kind of like romantic and sexy words, but I'm going to say productive. Productive. This yeah. man is a machine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Um, creative. Like just, yeah, original, free-spirited in all the best ways. What a great yeah. team. That is yeah. good. What a great team. Creative and theme. productive. I think, I, think we, I think we sometimes have a little bit of that dynamic Maybe. going, productive creativity sometimes. Yeah. Great. Uh, Michael and Haley, thanks so much for joining us. We're going to put in our show notes mm-hmm. all about Mind Stuck with the sequel Mind Struck. Coming <laughs> Yep, watch this it. space. That's watch right. this space. Uh, but thanks so much for joining it's us pleasure. today. It's been thanks lovely. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your time. Oh, there was so much more I wanted to talk about because that book that he's, his last book, Mastering the Art of Changing Minds, it sounds a bit about voodoo, hoodoo. It's not. No. It's just a... It's through his research and talking to psychologists and it's really interesting. And mm. he, on his Instagram, he gives you like a couple little tips and stuff about how to work with people and okay. yeah, well, we better we better put Michael's Instagram up on our in, of course. On, on, in the show notes yeah, so people you can, can check him out. I think he's got a website as well. well. I'm sure he does. You can go see one of Haley's productions. Yeah. I, I look when I saw that you know changing people's minds I'm like, mm, are we supposed to be doing that? Are we supposed <laughs> to be changing people trying to change people? And then no, it's not that's not what No, it is. no, definitely not. Definitely yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. Oh, I know so many cool things. And I wanted to butt in ski on so many things. I thought, oh, you, you can't do that. This is not a place to, you know. But uh, I love their analogy about the analogy about the dishwasher. You know, oh, and, yeah, and, that one and, he'd read about. Yeah, the, the, the raccoon. The you Swedish know, architect. Yeah, yeah <laughs> the, the Swedish architect and the raccoon throwing. I always find that, you know, dishes need to talk to each other in a dishwasher. So you've got to have space between so the water can get through. So if you okay. just chuck it all in, put spoons together, they never wash. I see. Right. Gotcha. And yeah. especially if you've got a crap dishwasher like we do. Yeah. yeah but, yeah, the, it's communication. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. That's yeah. all about. It's, abso- it's all about. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. See you in the next one. Bye.